Welcome to the exam review for exam two for Math 1220 Calculus 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. So in this video, I want to quickly talk about the contents of exam two uh, for our class to give you, the student, an idea of what you should be studying for and how to better prepare for this exam, of course. Now, there are some specific information you definitely need to know about the exam, like the time, place, manner, which it's going to take place. But as these change from semester to semester, that will not be included within um, this video. Um, so things like what materials am I allowed to use during the test? When will the test take place? Um, dates, those type of things. Please consult the exam syllabus that can probably be found on Canvas uh, for the semester specifics. Um, this video is just going to focus on the structure and contents of the exam. Um, just so you're aware, Exam 2 is going to cover materials from Lecture 10 all the way up to Lecture 21. So a quick summary of what's going to be on this exam is there'll be techniques of integration. Uh, so this will include many of the new techniques that we've learned about, like we've learned about trig integrations. So how we can use trig identities to help us compute uh, antiderivatives of trigonometric functions. Um, but we also have trig subs that we've now learned about how the method of substitution can be modified to turn algebraic functions into trigonometric functions and use the techniques about trigonometric integrals to help you in that setting. Um, we, of course, also have our partial fraction decompositions um, that help us with uh, rational functions. We have things like a rationalizing substitution. Um, but we also have some of the more classic materials, uh, techniques we've learned about previously, like U-subs um, are still perfectly valid here. Integration by parts, of course, is also a valid technique that we need to be aware of. And so, and then, of course, you can put all of these together in a street fighter manner. And any of these techniques could be used oftentimes in combination with others. And so the vast majority of the test is going to be about these techniques of integration. Now, of course, some other things that should be mentioned, uh, topics of numerical integration integration will also be covered here. Midpoint rule, trapezoid rule, Simpson's rule, uh, improper integrals will also be discussed on this exam. And then also we have two applications of integration that will also appear on this exam as well. Uh, this includes arc length and surface area. And so let's say a little bit more about these topics. Uh, in just a second. I do want to mention, just like exam one, there are going to be three sections on this exam. Uh, there's a multiple choice section, a short response section, and a free response section. The structure and policy related to these types of questions are identical to the previous exam. Uh, there'll be four multiple choice questions uh, worth five points each. There'll be four uh, short response questions that'll be worth seven points each. And then there will be four free response questions, most of them which are worth 12 points, but there is a 16-pointer uh, that will be coming up. And let's take a look at these topics. All right, so let's start with the multiple choice section. Four questions there, like I said, five points each. Uh, the first question that you're going to see on this exam is going to be a question about trigonometric substitution. But all that the question is going to ask you, it's not going to ask you to evaluate an antiderivative. It's just going to ask you which trigonometric substitution should you use when uh, considering an algebraic integral like this one. Now, clearly this comes down to what is the square root doing? Um, we're interested in basically three basic forms. Uh, so you have the square root of a squared minus u squared, where a is here a constant number, u is some function. This is like what we use for a sign substitution. We could also look at the square root of a squared plus u squared, that's useful for, a, you would want to use a tangent substitution in that regard. And you also have the square root of u squared minus a squared. A secant substitution would be relevant there, but also keeping track of where do all the coefficients go and things like that. Question one just asks you, what is the correct trigonometric substitution you should use to start the uh, start the antiderivative process. So just the very initial step of a trig sub. Uh, there will be another question in the free response that asks you specifically to compute uh, an integral using trigonometric substitution. This is just asking what's the very first step? What is the substitution in play? It's a fun question. Uh, question two is very similar in nature that using the techniques we've developed, we just ask what's the very first step? So imagine you're tasked to find the antiderivative of a rational function like the following. This is definitely more complicated than we usually do, but this question only asks what is 
the correct template of the partial fraction decomposition. So we care about the factorization of the denominator. So do we have linear factors and how often do they show up? Do we have irreducible quadratic factors? How often do they show up? In which case we need to have a partial fraction for each of the powers there. So like with an x squared on bottom, you have a partial fraction for x and for x squared. Similar thing can be said for x plus two squared. And then for irreducible quadratics, you have to deal with those as well. Um, for a linear denominator, you should have just a constant on top. For a, for a uh, irreducible quadratic, you should have some type of linear factor on top dx plus c e or something like that. And so question two is again, just a starter question. You don't have to do the complete partial fraction decomposition. All that you have to do is determine what is the right template to get started. Now, if you need a review of any of these topics here, be, remember that the topics of partial fraction decomposition were covered in lecture 14 and 15. And then likewise, topics of trigonometric substitution were discussed in lessons 12 and 13. Please go back to your notes on those topics if you need some more assistance. Uh, for example, the codex was introduced in uh, lesson 12. That's exactly what you need to use for um, question number one. Question number two, um, we saw we saw linear factors show up in lesson 14. Irreducible quadratics showed up in lesson 15. So you'd want to consult both of those there. Uh, so then coming to question number three. Question number three is going to ask you to compute uh, a, a numerical approximation of an uh, integral using I, one of these numerical integration techniques like the trapezoidal rule is a possibility, the midpoint rule, Simpson's rule. You should know all three of those rules here. Now, how this question is going to be formatted is that your function is going to be given actually as a table. So we see the x coordinates are given here, and then their corresponding f of x values are given there as well. So the way you would read this is that f of 10 is equal to negative 12, and f of 22 is equal to 1. Using this table, you'll be asked to approximate an integral. In this case, you're integrating from 10 to 30, and you're going to use five subdivisions. In that regard, you want to use the, and for this one, you're going to use the trapezoidal rule T5 to then estimate what is the area under the curve. You're going to estimate this integral. Be aware that the way that this question is formatted, you won't be given an algebraic function. You cannot use the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate this integral. You actually only have enough information to approximate it using the method we're introduced here. Trapezoidal rule, midpoint rule, or Simpson's rule are all possibilities here. Now, if you need some more practice or need to review what's, how these calculations are actually done, uh, as a reminder, lesson 17 uh, reminded us about the trapezoidal and midpoint rules, and lesson 18 was exclusively about Simpson's rule. You'll probably want to go to both of those for some further practice there. And then the last question in the multiple choice section uh, will be, uh, you'll be asked to evaluate an improper integral. Um, so these are the cases we have integrals where one bound goes off to infinity or negative infinity, maybe both, or maybe the integral approaches a vertical asymptote. And so how do you, how do you deal with um, improper integrals? This is exactly what we learned about in uh, lesson 19. And so question number four will ask you to compute uh, to evaluate an improper integral, be aware that the answer could be that it's divergent. Um, if the integral is divergent, that is the area under the curve goes off towards infinity, you would select choice F uh, that's divergent. But if the integral is convergent, then you have to actually provide what was the value it converges towards. And so then you would say whatever you think it is, pi over two or, or whatever. Moving on to the short response section. Remember, there's four questions here, and each of them are worth seven points each. Um, question number five will be a second question about numerical integration, and this will be the last question on the test coming from numerical integration. Uh, what it's going to ask you to do is to work with the error bounds associated to these numerical estimates. So the trapezoid rule has an error bound. The midpoint rule has an error bound. Simpson rule has an error bound. I recommend you turn to the study materials or to your notes to find the exact formulas for those error bounds. But let's say that we were working with an integral. Let's say the integral from 0 to 1 of cosine of x squared dx. Uh, be aware that that would be a very difficult function to find an antiderivative for. But we could estimate the area under the curve using something like the trapezoid rule. But how do we know we have a good enough accuracy? Well, this question asks what choice of n, what's the smallest choice of n to guarantee that the 
approximation is accurate to four decimal places. Well, there's an error bound associated to the trapezoidal rule. You would use that to solve for n. Remember, you always have to round up in that situation. For Simpson's rule, you always have to round up to the next even integer because for Simpson's rule, it always has to be an even number there. Um, these error bounds will be dependent upon how large second or fourth derivatives are equal to. So for convenience, you might be given information about the second or fourth derivative so that the exercise focuses on the error bound and not on the, um, the implicit derivative calculations that are necessary as well. So like this one's formatted in such a way that the K value, you can actually argue a six um, and that'll help you when you try to determine what is the best choice of n in that situation. So these type of questions about error bounds showed up in these numerical approximation sections. So again, like we saw in the previous slide, uh, lesson 17 will give you the error bounds for the midpoint rule and trapezoid rule. Lesson 18 will give you the error bound for Simpson's rule. You should be prepared to do any of those three. Uh, question number six, you'll be given a trigonometric integral and you'll be asked to find the antiderivative of that trigonometric integral. And it could be anything under the sun. Um, it could involve sines and cosines. The periods could be the same. The periods could be different. It could involve secants and tangents. I mean, maybe even cosecants and cotangents, right? We've learned all about these techniques. We should be looking for things like, is there an odd number of cosines, an even number of cosines, uh, odd number of sines, an even number of sines, tangents and secants, similar questions can be asked there. A whole litany of trig identities come into, come into play there. Question six will be about any one of those uh what any one of those type of calculations um this is the only question on the test that directly comes from lessons 10 and 11. just as a reminder lesson 10 was actually broken up in two pieces the first half ended our lesson about integration by parts but then the second half then introduced our topic of trigonometric integrals. There's some important examples and identities found there. Uh, lesson 11 then continued and then finished this discussion about trigonometric integrals. Um, so like I said, question six is gonna be the only question on the test that comes directly from there. But like I mentioned earlier, there will be a question in the free response section about trigonometric substitution. The whole method of trigonometric substitution is to turn an algebraic integral into a trigonometric integral. And so all the techniques that are applicable here will be applicable there as well. And that's why I only put one direct question coming from lessons 10 and 11 because the trig sub questions will ask you to do similar information as well now this is an indefinite integral do remember that whatever you calculate you do need a plus c there for full credit uh, so don't forget that c uh, the other two questions on the show response section are going to be questions that ask you to set up, simplify, but do not evaluate an integral. And these are going to do with our two application topics. Uh, question number seven is going to ask you to set up an integral to compute the arc length of some curve. Question number eight will similarly ask you to set up an integral that computes the surface area of some surface of revolution like we did of course in sections let's see what the the lesson numbers were lesson 20 for arc length and lesson 21 talked about surface area you're going to want to go to those lessons your corresponding notes the sections from the book in order to find the appropriate formulas for that situation um, do be aware that you asked to set this thing up so when you set up an integral you do of course need the integral symbol you need to have the the appropriate bounds a and B. There needs to be, of course, a function, and that function might be multi-part because of the formulas in play there. Like, for example, for surface area, in addition to having a square root likely be in the integral, you also have a radius to deal with. There's also a, a, a 2 pi floating around. So look for those. But you also need to have your differential. That is part of the integral. Um, it does represent a geometric part of these problems uh, and so omitting the integral would make it incorrect particularly in these examples right here because the default integral you're actually integrating with respect to ds for which ds can be modified into a dx or a dy that is you can integrate with respect to x or y if you don't specify which one you are using you actually can't necessarily glean from the information what it is it could be a dx or a dy and therefore you need to be explicitly including that in your calculation there
I should also mention that you should simplify these things as appropriate. Now, I don't necessarily require every possible simplification under the sun, but you definitely got to get all the low-hanging fruit ones, and um, just some natural algebraic simplifications are appropriate here. Um, you do not need to evaluate the integral. There will be no credit given for that. But if you're lacking appropriate and necessary uh, simplifications, you could lose some points there as well. And that then gets us through the short response section. The final section of the exam is the free response section. Uh, there's four questions here. Now their points change based upon the perceived guilt difficulty of these questions. Most of them are in the 12 point range though. So question number nine is a 12 point problem and it'll ask you to evaluate an indefinite integral. Now you are allowed to use any technique you want on this problem, but be aware that this question was intended to be a trigonometric substitution. So things you can do to show your work because this is a free response question question, you do need to show your work for full credit there. You could say things like, what is the trigonometric substitution you're using? You could say things like, well, x equals a times whatever the trig function is. Let's say it's a tangent substitution. I'm not saying that's what the correct substitution is here. I'm trying to not give away the answer. I want you to work this out on your own. But let's say that you think the trig sub is x equals a tangent. Then you could be like, well, dx equals a secant squared theta d theta. You can... Um, then also tell us about the square root. The square root of a squared plus x squared is equal to a secant. This is all very important information. You can then also, if you want to, you can draw the triangle. Not necessary, but this is one way to show your work. If I have a tangent substitution, I might say x over a, the square root of x squared plus a squared, like so. Then once that's done, of course, you can start doing your substitutions there. You can be like, oh, well, x squared is a tangent squared now. Um, the square root is then a secant. And again, I know I'm actually doing the wrong problem. This is just for illustrative purposes here. The dx would be like a secant squared theta d theta. Then you proceed to simplify this thing, um, compute it. But at the end, you should probably switch it back into some antiderivative in terms of x. Um, unless it's a definite integral. If it's a definite integral, then of course you can switch the bounds and find the number using the trigonometric function. But most likely this will be an indefinite integral. So the variable, if you have some function in terms of theta that you would find here, that's good, partial credit. But for full credit, you do need to switch it back to the function of x. And as this is an indefinite question, uh, indefinite integral, you need that plus C for full credit there. So there's a lot going on because you'll have to convert from algebra to trig, solve the trig and antiderivative, then switch it back from trig to algebra. There's a lot of stuff going on there, which is why this is worth so many points, 12 points there. Uh, and also, just as a reminder, I mean, I've already said it in this video, but in case you missed it before, let me just remind you again that the topics of trigonometric substitution are discussed in details in lessons 12 through 13. Uh, the next question, number 10, it's also worth 10 points, and it's of comparable difficulty to question number 9. The difference now, though, is that uh, we are given a rational function, and so you're going to want to find the antiderivative using the method of partial fraction decomposition as discussed in lessons 14 and 15. And again, this one question could cover any of the topics that we've seen using partial fractions. So in particular, if I was to get started with this, there's some things you should look for. Uh, you might need to use long division, that is division of the polynomials. This happens in particular if the fraction is improper. That is the numerator is bigger than the denominator. The example on the screen right now seems to suggest you might need to do that. Um, it might also be necessary to complete the square um, because you do have to sometimes deal with these irreducible quadratics in order to prepare for a tangent typically, uh, but it could, it could be a sine or secant as well. In order to prepare for a trigonometric substitution, you often have to complete the square. Be aware that this is an algebraic skill that might also be necessary on question number nine. You might have to complete the square before you can do the substitution. Clearly factoring might be an important thing that has to happen in this situation, can you factor the polynomial denominator? I won't make the factorizations too difficult, but pulling out things like a greatest common divisor, our common factorization forms, like uh, difference of squares, perfect square trinomials, maybe like factoring by grouping. There are some elementary factoring techniques that uh, were on the, on the par of like intermediate algebra, math 1010, that would be appropriate and be expected of students to know here. So there are some algebraic things you have to do there. Then of course, you're 
you're gonna have to do the partial fraction decomposition itself, come up with the correct template, like we do on question number two from the multiple choice section, solve for the coefficients. Now, as you're solving for the coefficients and your partial fraction decomposition, of course, you can use this technique of annihilation where you choose strategic cool values of X to eliminate everything except for one of the parameters, that's acceptable. You could set up a system of linear equations and solve it. You could do a combination of those two methods. However you find the coefficients, as long as it's done correctly, I don't care how you do it. So you'll need to find the partial fraction decomposition. And then at the end, you do have to integrate the function itself. If you've computed the, the PFD, it shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, you'll have some standard forms there. Uh, typically the antiderivative will involve logarithms and arc tangents. Uh, that come from u substitutions. Those are often necessary in this situation. Um, likewise, you might have to do some trig subs when you have irreducible quadratics. And so just some things to remember here. It might be useful to observe that if you have a function of the form du over u, uh, this is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of u plus a constant. That does show up with enough frequency that it's worth mentioning. I should also mention that if you, if you have the integral du over a squared plus u squared, where u is some function of x, a is a constant, the antiderivative in that situation is going to be 1 over a arctangent of u over a plus a constant. These two antiderivative forms are of so common frequency when you're dealing with partial fraction decompositions. It might be worth you know memorizing these or put in a reference that you can find later on. All right, let's now move to the last page of the exam. So questions 11 and 12. Uh, question number six, uh, sorry, question number 11 is worth 16 points. Um, it is the climactic question of this exam. And this question is supposed to represent um, our Street Fighter integral question that we learned about, of course, in the lessons here, where anything goes on this one, as opposed to questions nine and 10, where I then I, I, I prophesied to you what the topics are going to be. You're going to use trig subs on number nine. If you do something else, you're probably making it harder than it needs to be. On question number 10, you're going to use partial fraction decomposition of some kind. And again, if you don't, then you're probably doing it wrong. Not necessarily, but you're definitely making it harder if you're not. With question 11, anything goes. Anything goes, anything goes. So this involves any of the topics that we've learned about. Now, the specific lesson about these uh, about street fighting was lesson 16 which we talked about techniques of integration for which remember those techniques. I mean, sometimes the right thing to do is some type of algebraic manipulation, use algebraic identities to help you out here. Um, that is certainly a possibility here. Uh, but also by the nature of the problem, maybe it's trigonometric or maybe you do a trigonometric substitution. Um, trigonometric identities may also be useful in this situation. Again, you might want to go back to lessons 10 and 11 to review some of those topics. Um, but like I said, you also could use substitution. Of course, the topic of U substitution is perfectly relevant here. That actually goes back to lesson two. Um, for this for this lecture series here. Um, old topics are just as valuable on this example as well. So speaking of which, we could talk about integration by parts. Integration by parts was introduced in lessons nine and 10. Um, integration by parts might be necessary to work on these type of problems. Um, in addition to trig subs, uh, excuse me, in addition to U subs, you might have to do a trig sub. This one I'm looking at, I don't see any sums or differences of square, so probably don't need a trig sub, but maybe. Um, and which, of course, I've already said it twice, but I'll say it one more time. Trig subs were introduced in lessons 12 and 13 here. That might be very, very appropriate to use. Uh, of course, methods of partial fraction decomposition uh, might be very relevant for this one, which again, that was lessons 14 and 15. How do you deal with uh, partial fractions just much like we did in, in question number 10 there. Uh, but also an important topic to, to pay particular attention to. In lesson 16, we actually focus a lot of time on a method known as the rationalizing substitution for which you do basically a U sub that turns your function into well, into basically a partial fraction. Well, that is a, a rational function for which you do partial fraction decompositions. And this is very useful when you have a substitution like u equals the square root of x, because um, in that case, you get that du is equal to 
well, I'll actually say it this way. You get that dx is equal to 2u du. The derivative of the function is actually like similar to the original function itself, and that can be very useful. This also happens with like exponentials. Um, if u equals e to the x, then du equals e to the x dx, for which that tells us that dx is equal to du over u, um, things like that. So this rationalizing and substitution is very useful with radicals and exponentials because of the similarities between the functions and its derivative. And so when I look at something like this, um, my thoughts are maybe a rationalizing and substitution could be very useful here. But honestly, anything can go. This is why this question is worth so many points. Do not give up on this question. Even if you're stumped, that is too many points just to throw away. Um, work at it. Do what you can. Play with multiple attempts. Um, you can definitely get some partial credit, even if you don't do it all the way. Um, don't forfeit this question. It's a very important one, and it really much is going to characterize how one does um, these techniques of integration. The last question, uh, question number 12, it's only worth 10 points here, not as much as the other three, certainly. Um, and this is actually a question about improper integrals. We had one question in the multiple choice. There'll be a second one right here. Um, in this situation, you'll be asked to show that an integral, an improper integral either converges or diverges. It'll tell you whether it's convergent or divergent. Um, in particular, this question, this function will be chosen in such a way that you will not likely be able to compute an elementary antiderivative of that function. Um, so we can't necessarily apply the fundamental theorem calculus directly. Instead, though, what we can use is an, a theorem we learned about when we learned about improper integrals. This is the, actually the so-called comparison test. Remember, the comparison test tells us that if an improper integral is smaller than a, a convergent integral, then it's likewise convergent. Um, but also, if an integral is bigger than a divergent improper integral, then it also must be divergent. So that is, we can potentially simplify the function by comparing it to something which you know to be convergent or divergent, and then use that. Um, make sure you state ex explicitly when is the comparison test being used, and so try to mimic some examples uh, that we saw, of course, in Lesson 19. And so that gets us to the end of this exam. And we've now talked about all the topics that are covered on this exam. Uh, in addition to, of course, this video, use the exam syllabus, the practice exam, and other study resources that are available to you on Canvas. If you have any questions, please reach out to me or other appropriate sources to get the help you need as you prepare for this exam. I'm quite confident that you will be able to do very well on this exam if you are sufficiently prepared for it. And let me help you prepare for the exam if you're not there already.